was in catering at TNA's uh, catering line, Ric Flair comes up right behind me in the line. And I'm sitting here like, this is Ric Flair. What, what am I doing? And I looked at him and I said, would, I said, would you like to go in front of me? And he, he was very humble. He said, nah, kid, you're good. Go, go ahead in front of me. And then later on, I handed Ric Flair mustard. So that was, uh, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, kid, can you hand us the mustard? I said, uh, Rick, nature boy, you got it. And then we handed the, uh, the mustard over to the, to the WCW table in catering. I think uh, Eric Bischoff was there, Ric Flair, oh, no. Sting, Lex Luger, and Scott Steiner were all sitting at that table. And I'm just looking over my shoulder like, whoa, this is crazy. Welcome to another episode of Velvet Room Conversations. I am your host and proprietor of the Velvet Room Sly, aka Gray Fox. And tonight, joining us for conversation, he is a content creator, streamer, speedrunner, host, Silent Hill expert, and fan, Georgia native, wrestling aficionado, most, most importantly. You know him as coach. I know him as a good friend. My good friend and eternal enigma. How are you doing? So I am doing pretty, pretty well. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Good to have you again. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on. I knew when I was starting the plan for this podcast, you were the one of the ones I, that I definitely had to have. You have a you have one like you have a larger than life personality, and you have one of the the best personalities I know in terms of all the content creator friends I've met throughout these last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, I appreciate it. I'm just being who I am in front of a camera and (laughs) trying not to try not to set the world on fire too much, but just a little bit, just a little bit, but, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. I've known you for quite a while. We were talking about this before I said, known sly for a long time so when you gave me the date you said we could do friday the 5th and i looked at the calendar and i said oh man that's that's the braves home opener i don't know but i was like i've known him a long time i'll i'll uh i'll do a favor for him but when this game started i'm watching it right now the diamondbacks they opened up with three runs in the first inning so it turned around i think you're doing me a favor so i don't have what inning i don't have to watch a game right now so what inning are we good to be here what inning are we at right now? we are now in the we're in the second inning. The Braves did get one back. See, it's, uh, it's a little so. early. It's a little early. <laughs> it's early. Yeah, yeah. I can always come back. Yeah. So I love baseball. You could add baseball aficionado to that list yes. as well. Because like that's the thing about baseball. It's never over. Uh-uh. No time limit. You never know what'll happen. See, you you have been blessed as a Braves fan with with with, with recency because like I I lifelong Yankees fan and we had our era we had our era and now we are I remember I remember it very well yeah. the Braves were the were the victims or some of that era <laughs> so I remember it yep remember very well now we're just we're constantly rebuilding constantly <laughs> I'll say that I'll say that the Yankees feel like they're in that middle ground we're like they're not completely out of it like Oakland is mm-hmm but they're just like in the middle. Like they don't want to completely rebuild, but they don't want to spend money like the Dodgers do. So it's like, go do what you can in that. We AL used East. to spend Baltimore that money pretty though. good. We used to, mm-hmm. we, we had like a blank check in the nineties and the yep. early two thousands. It was just a blank check. When the boss was there, Mr. Steinbrenner, yep. he, he had the bank account. He said, bring anybody you want. As long as they help the team win. And they did. I remember it very well. Oh, boy. How have you been? How uh I know uh when I reached out to you, you were at PAX. How was how was PAX? Mm. PAX East was pretty awesome. Uh I've gotta say, you know, as the world sort of I I I say normalizes. I don't think the world will ever be quite the way it was before COVID happened mm-hmm. in 2020. Uh, but I gotta say out of every sort of a convention or event that I've been to since since we started kind of opening things back up, PAX East was a lot of fun, and it genuinely started to feel like things were kind of coming back around wholly. Like, that was the event where I thought, man, we're, 
we're so back. You know, that <laughs> phrase, we're so bad. That's what it felt like. It was a lot of fun. Ran into a lot of people uh, from the community, met a lot of new people, saw a lot of great merch uh, folks, watched a lot of panels. I got to see Mega64 for the first time in my life. They were a big inspiration for me uh, for wanting to do things on the internet. And it was just a good time. Saw a lot of games, talked to a lot of developers and publishers. Just a great, great, great time. I wish I could do it again. It was, uh, it was awesome. Did you get any Konami time there? Was Konami there? Uh, Konami was not there, uh, I, but I did, I did snag. I don't have it with me right now, mm-hmm. but I did get a, uh, well, I have a, like a little example. Okay. One of my moderators, AJ Shanks made this for me on like a 3d printer, this oh. little halo of the sun deal. There was a company there and I've, I don't, I don't have their name on the top of my head, but I can get it to you later. But, uh, they were selling like shadow boxes of different gaming they had like little gaming pictures but they had shadow boxes so they had a halo of the sun and they had a really nice one of pyramid head from silent hill 2 that i'm going to hit them up on their website for a little bit later they said they sold things on the website and and things of that nature so while konami was not there i did pick up some some good konami swag i got that shadow box and that metal gear solid hoodie from fan gamer so it was pretty, it was pretty oh nice. yeah fan gamer has some solid stuff i always love fan gamer stuff. they have great stuff it's awesome yeah because while you were at while everybody was at pax east i was in new orleans for bourbon fest that's like i when i was planning my trips for the year and um i was talking to the to the guy who sponsors my trips i'm like he's like yeah there's pax east yeah i've been working on bourbon content and i haven't been to new orleans in 25 years so i kind of made the, mm. the, the decision to go to bourbon fest and I don't regret it. I honestly don't regret it. it. Like I still part of me wishes I was in New Orleans right now. Is that it's the city's yeah. just that good? And plus, I learned a lot about bourbon. Um, met a few industry folks. It was a really really good time. So every everybody that I've talked to that goes to New Orleans has that opinion. I I have I've been around, but that's one place that I have not been able to get to yet. Really? Uh, but. My uh my my partner, my girlfriend reliever mm-hmm. wants to go to New Orleans a lot. So we might we might make that happen at some point a little bit later. I can tell but every you. every uh every person I hear that goes to New Orleans has that same opinion. Like they just can't wait to get back. I can tell you the places to eat. I can I I can definitely give you that because it's just <laughs> it is just a such a cultural mecca and like in terms of food and everything, it's just so so good. Yep. Well, if that if that day ever comes, I will hit you up for your recommendations because I, I do, do believe you know what you're talking about. Please do. Now, I'll do now. Uh, I kind of want to get to um, because, uh, like I said, I've, I've known you for such a long time, and the way I was introduced to you was GDQ, your very mm-hmm. first uh, run of the room, and. And I was watching GDQ and I see this dude with, with, with the NWO shirt on. I'm like, that is like college me. That is so college me. And, uh, yep. and because uh, like I, I grew up watching wrestling, like uh, both WCW, WWF, like everything. Same. Same. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I still I still have my red in red NWO shirt that I can't fit anymore because I'm too big. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, like. What um, where did you where did you start in terms of when and where did you start in terms of your content creation journey? Like even before, what were you doing before you started? Well, I was doing stuff a, a way before that Silent Hill Four run. So what happened is I've been on the internet very long time since about I think the first time I got on the internet was nineteen ninety seven. And the internet has sort of, I've seen the internet progress over time into kind of what it is now. And all of the other eras out there, I've been able to watch firsthand. So I started seeing, you know, YouTube cropped up in the mid 2000s. And then it started getting a little bit bigger. And nobody was really making any money or making a career off YouTube at that point. But you would start seeing these things, you know, as as we call it now, going viral. And you would start seeing people get popular and they get a little bit of a following and 
you know, everybody likes to be popular a little bit, but I would just kind of sit back and watch. I wasn't really at the forefront of everything. I just kind of, I was very much an observer. Well, the thing that crossed me or converted me from a consumer to a producer of content, I would say would be, there was a part of me that was very passionate about games being released unfinished and very poorly done. Yeah. And this was becoming an epidemic in the early 2010s. So the first real video that I put on YouTube was a thing about a game called Mortal Kombat Arcade Collection. I was an avid Mortal Kombat fan when I was young. They put out the Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and 3. They put out this collection with online features and things like that. When they launched it, it was absolute buggy, junk. Nobody could play it. It was all messed up. So I made a just a text video of me talking. If you go back on my YouTube account, you should still be able to find it. I think it's called This Game Sucks Mortal Kombat Arcade <laughs> Collection. But what it is is just... It's just it's just me talking. I didn't have a video. I didn't have video capabilities. I didn't have a capture card, but I had a voice. So I wanted to help save people some money and not have them waste money on this. And I didn't think it'd be a big deal. And all of a sudden, I don't know where it got posted or where it showed up, but I would look at it and all of a sudden the views on this thing were going through the roof. I think it got up at one point around 50,000 views, or I think that may be where it is now, but mm -hmm. 50,000 views blew my mind. For somebody who had never done this before, for something to take off like that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. People seem to have, feel something about this some way or another. And then his fate would have it about, I think it was about four or five months later, the... uh Silent Hill HD collection came out and I was, I was looking forward to it. I, I, I thought, Oh, this is going to be awesome. Like a new group of a new generation of people will be able to enjoy Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3. And it came out and it was the biggest piece of crap I'd ever seen. It was the, it was the worst remaster until Warcraft three and GTA definitive or whatever. That was the worst remaster I'd ever seen. And I did the same thing where, where I said, okay, I want to help save people some money because I bought this. And it was at a point where in my life where I wasn't really doing well financially and buying games on launch was a pretty big, pretty big financial decision for yeah. me. So I said, let me use my voice again. Let me make this video. So I got a program, but I didn't want to just do, I didn't want to just do audio. I wanted to show everybody what I was talking about. So I got a, so I didn't have a, uh, I'm trying to remember the timeline of this. So in late 2011, I did get a capture card. It was a black magic intensity pro 3.0 It was my first capture card. I still got it somewhere. So I recorded myself doing Silent Hill HD collection, then recorded myself doing normal Silent Hill two and three. And I got a program called Camtasia. I don't know if anybody here remembers Camtasia. There's a program called Camtasia's video editing software. I downloaded it and I made I got all this footage, put it all together, and I made two separate videos of Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3 HD with comparisons and commentary and everything. And it just it just blew up. It got like, I think right now it's still if you combine both videos, I think they got over. 350,000 or 400,000 views. And I, I saw this take off too. And I thought, Oh my gosh, I could, I might, I might have something here. I might need to think about this, uh -huh. but Twitch, Twitch was way more attractive to me than YouTube. I loved live aspects of things. I liked, I was just better live. I just, I, I've hung out with people all my life with video games in the background. So I thought, you know, Twitch is perfect for that. And back at the time, I started streaming when I got my capture card. It was still Justin TV. So I would do streams on Justin TV way back in the day. But that's really where I got my feet wet, so to speak, on con what we call now content creation or just streaming video games or making video game videos was trying to warn people not to buy these busted, <laughs> broken things that came out. 
So it started in 2011, 2012, and the YouTube success kind of made me feel like I had something going on. But I went over to Twitch, started doing things over there, and I really focused everything on live streaming. And that's where my journey started. Do you feel like uh, you still kind of have that mantle right now as on Twitch? The kind of like, because like you said, it's the live aspect. Do you feel like you have that mantle to just kind of still like play? Because you, you mainly focus on Silent Hill through, through speed running and through story. Uh, but you, you play a lot of other stuff. You play, you, you play the show. I've seen you play so many other games. You feel like you still have that mantle to kind of, you know, be a consumer's friend and, you know, still help people warn them about the quote unquote bad games. Yeah. 100%. Like if I, if I see a game that gets, and I feel like that's part of my responsibility too. I've, I've, since I've become successful in the space, I've kind of beaten the odds and cause the odds of being successful in this space are very low to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I feel a little bit of a responsibility to people. Like I am, I am able to acquire games when they come out or I can get review codes or whatever, just however, however you get them, I can get access to them. So if a game comes out and it's kind of, it's kind of trashy, I kind of feel like I have a, an obligation to let people know, for example, cyberpunk, when that came out, I got cyberpunk on day one. And to this day it's, and I know cyberpunk has changed now. It's, right. it's a very solid experience now, but in December, 2020, I think it was, it was not a solid experience and I got it on day one and I did two streams of it. And I said, mm, we may have to come back. We may have to circle back on this one a little bit later. I think this, I think this needs a little bit of work. So that that's a recent example of where I don't mind. Like if I can't, and I'm not the guy that goes into people's emails. And I'm like, give me a review code, review code, review code. I don't, I, to this day, I, I, I think maybe like, I've hit up a friend who could get me review codes for Resident Evil. But other than that, usually I just, I'm very humble about those things. I don't go around being like, give me a review code, review code, review code. I usually buy my own games. Mm -hmm. So Cyberpunk was an example where I said, okay, there's people that think this may not work out very well, but I'm going to buy it just to see how it goes. And I was able to give an opinion, an informed opinion of that game, which at the very beginning was very rough, but now it's very smooth. But yes, I absolutely still feel like I have the, uh, the authority or the ability to let people know if a game comes out and it's like, eh, you may want to, you may want to steer away from this one right now. So yeah, I think I do. Now, uh, going back to, uh, just streaming in general, because one thing one thing I love about your stream, um, and and it, it's I always tell tell you I want to be like you when I grow up because like you, <laughs> your production value is just through the roof. You, I, I kind of get the sense, and I was thinking about this, um, you know, in, in terms of just writing up like like my my thoughts and things to ask you. When you were growing up, did you watch a lot of game shows? I did. Uh, a shows. huge amount of game shows. shows. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I've told this story a lot on my stream. Some people may hear it for the first time on this, but uh -huh. when I was a kid, you always, you always ask a kid, Oh, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you know, you get the, you get the, the standard kid answers like, Oh, I want to be a, uh, you know, a fireman, a spaceman, the president, you know, blah, blah, blah. But mom says that every time anybody ever asked me that question, the, I always answered, I want to be a game show host. <laughs> I was obsessed with game shows. Uh, Pressure Luck was my favorite game show on planet Earth. I loved everything about it. Anytime there was a game show block on like CBS or any of the cable channels, I was right there at it. When we got digital cable at the house in 2001, I discovered Game Show Network, oh, which was boy. all game shows all the time. Yes. I was into that. And game shows were a huge influence on me when I was a kid. Yes. And again, like I said, it shows because like you, 
uh, like not only through your production, but through your personality, you have this kind of host persona in what you do with the wheel, with marbles, with everything. And, and I kind of got that. And I wouldn't have guessed, I honestly wouldn't have guessed pressure luck, even though pressure luck was my favorite. Uh, I was going to say, I was going to say more. It wasn't match game. I know who won match game. Oh, uh, God, there are so many. There are so many good hosts out there. It, yeah, there's a lot. It, I, I kind of draw you to more of a wink. Wink Martin. Wink Martindale. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Big part of my childhood, he was. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's that. And like, like I said, your your production value, like through the years, like you've just gone up and you you have the drops and it's kind of like it's kind of like you know live tv but like live radio which is kind of like what i kind of modeled my stream after when i started too which you know you have the drops and everything and i and when i started i had the drops and everything and it, it's yeah your your production talk to me about your production you know like your production mindset in terms of your stream what you modeled after did you have anything you modeled it after yeah so when i kind of when I took streaming seriously, right around 2015, I would say 2000, 2015 is when I kind of gave up the old, the old, uh, wrestling referee dream, which I had been doing for a few years before. So I kind of switched gears and I said, well, let me, let me go full throttle into Twitch. So every moment of my free time from work, cause I had a full-time job at the time I would just dedicate to Twitch. So I really didn't have a lot of didn't have a lot of time at the moment to dedicate to the production. I just wanted to make sure that I had good looking video, that my audio was clear and that nothing was just bad quality. But then things changed. And in 2017, I really took off and I was able to quit my job or at least was able to take a risk. I will say it wasn't a slam dunk. I was able to take a risk and quit my job for six months just to see if it would work. So things, I started kind of looking into things and I don't really have a theory for, or, or a blueprint for things. I'll just kind of, I always keep an eye on things for something to catch my eye. The first big investment I ever did for my production was lights, the key lights. And it, I was like, whoa, that changed everything. Then all of a sudden I got a better mic. And then all of a sudden I got a better camera. And then I got these little light sticks. And then I thought, well, you know, I need to have a background. So I have the slot machine. I have all this other stuff and I can pull out little props too, like this, like this championship belt. I can, I can kind of pull out anything that I need to. I don't really have a, a theory behind like what I want something to look like. I'm very, I can be very impulsive at times. Mm -hmm. I'll see something that catches my eye and I say, Oh, I want to do that. I want to do this. I want to figure out how to implement this. But the, the core things that I always tell people is you've got to make sure you know, you can do anything. You don't have to have a camera. You don't have to have a microphone, but boy, do they help. And if you have a camera, just make sure it's clear. Make sure people can see you. If you have audio, make sure it's clear. Make sure people can hear you. It does not have to be the best. My stuff wasn't the best when I started, mm -hmm. but you have to kind of find your personality. You have to find your groove but you can't do that until you find yourself first. So when you find yourself, then you can start playing around. Like I have, I'll have like little light shows that go on now. Like if I get a raid, some, some people in here from my streams may know if you get, if I get like a, a raid of at least 75, the undertaker dong and the lights will go off and all that. So I, I just kind of look and see what I think gets my attention or would get my attention. And that's what I'll implement It's I don't really have a, a strict vision and I'm very much a changer. I change things a lot. I think you got to keep things fresh. I think you have to keep things moving. You can't stay the same for too long. That's just my philosophy. Mm -hmm. And versus I'm just very impulsive versus having like a plan or writing things down or a roadmap. I just kind of wing it. And if something works and it works, if it doesn't trash it, do something else. But I just try to make sure that my mic sounds good, my video looks good, 
And then we'll kind of put the pieces together after that. Those are just the main things about my production that I make sure are, are sharp before anything else. And even going further in production, because you talked, uh, you talked about audio and I, uh, again, your audio is the cleanest and you, you have this voice, you, you, you have, you, you have this million dollar voice. Um, have you ever, have you ever done any voice work uh, off stream or any, have you been hired to do voice work? Personally? I have not really, I've never, I, 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 and to be outside fair, of, I haven't looked into GDQ. it either. Yeah. Like n- nothing at all. Like I, you know, I've done event hosting and things of that nature, right. but like, video game voiceover or like product voiceover. Nope. I've never, and it's not for a lack of interest. It's just, I I don't, I just haven't pursued it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just still so much in love with streaming that I, I don't want to say I naturally fight against devoting my time to things that are not streaming. Obviously that's not true because I'm here instead of streaming, but I just, I don't know. I just haven't gotten into that. And I've heard it all the time. I used to hear it from customers at my old job. People used to say on the phone when I would answer the phones and talk to customers, say, you should be on the radio, blah, blah, blah. I had this one couple, like a a husband and wife on the phone at my old job and they were playing around and had me on speakerphone. And the, the wife was like, can you say that? Can you say congratulations? We're the seventh caller on so-and-so and and so. (laughs) And so at the risk of getting in trouble, because, you know, they monitor all of our stuff, uh, I I did it because I thought, eh, it'd be good customer interaction. So, you know, I've been told a lot. I've just, just never, never fell into it. I think a lot of times in my life, I just wait to fall into things instead of pursuing them. And that may be the only thing, that may be the only reason why I haven't fallen into voice work. Mm -hmm. But no, I uh, just haven't. It just hasn't been a thing that's come up. I, I have thought about it a lot, and you know, there's always this. There's always the the saying, "Well, you can't stream forever." But then there's a part of me that's like, "Oh yeah, you think I can't stream forever?" So, you know, I'm always like, "Well, you know, you we we have a we have a mutual friend. You know her very well, Faye Lynn, right? Yeah, Faye. Yeah. You know Faye. Yeah." yeah. She does voice acting and stuff, and I see what she does, and I'm like, yeah, I think I'd be good at that. That's intriguing. But at the same time, like, I just love streaming, too. I just want to donate all my time uh, or devote all my time to streaming, too. So not yet, but it is something that I'm interested in doing is external voice work, for sure. I'm kind of shocked that she hasn't kind of talked you into it. She's told me a little bit about it, but uh-huh. at the same time, you know, I, I try to let things just happen and I don't, I haven't really hounded her for information about it. I bet if I did, she would give me info. I just, just not a thing that I've done so far. It's fair. Now, uh, again, uh, we, I kind of skirted past this, but you, you and I are huge, huge wrestling fans. Um, mm-hmm. Have you ever done anything in the business? I was, uh, from 2007 to 2014, I was a referee for just a whole bunch of, no, nobody, nobody like a big promotion, but for like the, for like Georgia independent promotions, Mm -hmm. I would just kind of go around on the weekends and do that from 2007 to 2014. I think the highest, the highest profile thing that I ever did in wrestling were two things. One, there is an there are two episodes of TNA Impact Wrestling from 2011, I think, where I am on the show as a security guard. I think they aired, if my brain has not deceived me, I think they aired on November 3rd and November 10th of 2011. So on November 3rd, we, we, all the security guards got together and we helped, uh, Jeff Hardy out of the ring at the end of that episode. At the beginning of the next episode, there was a confrontation between Bobby Roode and James Storm and James Storm comes out, all the security guards, which is really just us local indie guys, which came out, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, you know, don't, don't go down there. You got to stay apart. What are you doing? Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
And then all of a sudden, James Storm just starts walloping people. I'm I'm the first security guard that he punches, like right in the face. So that was pretty cool. But I got to meet a whole lot of people in the business. I was I was pretty starstruck that day backstage. I think, you know, Rob Van Dam was there, Jeff Hardy was there, uh, just everybody was there. Scott Steiner, Sting, uh, Lex Luger was backstage. He wasn't on the show, but Sting brought him backstage. I'm just starstruck uh ho i was i was kind of bitter hulk hogan and kurt angle weren't there but everybody else was there and it was a uh, rick flair was that rick flair i was in catering at tna's uh catering line rick flair comes up right behind me in the line and i'm sitting here like this is rick flair what what am i doing and i looked at him and i said would i said would you like to go in front of me? And he, he was very humble. He said, nah, kid, you're good. Go, go ahead in front of me. And then later on, I handed Ric Flair mustard. So that was, uh, <laughs> he tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey kid, can you hand us the mustard? I said, uh, Rick, nature boy, you got it. And then we handed the, uh, the mustard over to the, to the WCW table in catering. I think, uh, Eric Bischoff was there. Ric Flair, oh, no. Sting, Lex Luger, and Scott Steiner were all sitting at that table. And I'm just looking over my shoulder, like, whoa this is crazy this is just wild so there was that and also the other notable thing that i did in wrestling which is pretty hilarious there was an episode of a show that was setting the the, the world on fire 11 years ago called here comes honey boo boo oh boy and they opened a season in 2013 going around to wrestling shows and they filmed at a show that I was working on and we, and TLC was there. We had to sign all these release waivers and all that. And I'm, I'm in the background of a season premiere episode of here comes honey boo boo in the wrestling business. So those are my, <laughs> those are my two, those are my two stories from wrestling. I never really did anything else. The business was just so different at that point. There wasn't really a whole lot. Everything. I, I look at what's going on on WrestleMania weekend now with all these indie promotions and AEW and all this and, and, and NXT now. Mm -hmm. NXT wasn't really a thing when I did all that. And it just makes my head spin. But it's really good for everybody that there are so many opportunities to get into you know, into some serious business now, whereas where I was in the business, not really a whole lot of opportunities. It was just like WWE was the king. They didn't have NXT. TNA was sort of a thing. And for those of you uninitiated to wrestling, TNA is not some weird, it's not some weird sexy thing. It was short for total nonstop action. So I just wanted to clarify that. I know that's a weird name, but that was pretty much it. Those two instances being uh, at Impact and Honey Boo Boo. Those are the two most remarkable things that I did in wrestling. But I still remember them very well. And I appreciate the the opportunities to be on both. Now, back in the day, I don't know if you remember the show, this this WWE show back in the day where they gave, uh, you know, random people, I guess you had to sign up or anything, opportunities. Tough enough. Yeah, did you yeah. did you ever thought mm -hmm. about doing tough enough? No, nah, I didn't. I I trained. So when I started in wrestling, it was still very we like to call it carny. Mm -hmm. It was still a very restrictive thing. It was almost like a secret club type deal. Yeah. In two thousand one, you nobody. If, uh, the only people that really knew how the business worked was if you were really really deep on the internet, and not a whole lot of people were in two thousand one. But I was. But at the same time. When you started, even if you just want to be a referee, they put you through the the legit training. Like I remember going out to a town called Milledgeville, Georgia, in February 2001, in some in some dude's backyard with a ring set up in the rain, taking a hundred bumps on my back, running the ropes, taking a hundred bumps after running the ropes. Like so that you have to. They trained you. They made sure you took your licks. So I, I knew how to bump and and run the ropes and do all the basic stuff. But after I got going, I was just kind of a referee. So uh -huh. for Tough Enough, that's mostly just for people that were working in the ring. And I did had no, no desire to do that. So <laughs> 
if they had a tough enough for referees, would have been there all day, but it just wasn't a thing, unfortunately. <laughs> Pat, who uh growing up, who were who were some of your favorites? So funny story. I, I was not a big fan of Hulk Hogan growing up. And I'll tell you why. I was an inch, I was a very observational kid. Hogan was the only guy that wouldn't slap hands with the fans on the way to the ring. That used to be a thing when we were kids. Like you would watch the good guys slap the hands of the fans when they came down the ring and everybody would stick their hand out wanting to get their, you know, wanting to get a high five. Hogan would never touch any of the, would never high five any of the fans. So I immediately didn't like him. So that was the thing. But I, I, I was a huge fan. And unfortunately, he he passed on pretty early. But I I remember being a big fan of Owen Hart oh, yeah. for that reason. Oh, yeah. I went to a WWF live event in 1992. Owen Hart was the first guy that high fived me on the way to the ring. I I was the kid with my hand out there. Owen Hart high fived me, and from that moment on, I was an Owen Hart fan for life. So he was. He was he was one of my favorites for sure. Owen Hart was. I'm trying to think of anybody else. Uh, I remember uh, Ricky Steamboat. Really liked Ricky Steamboat in WCW. Uh, Dustin Rhodes. I liked him a lot too. He's still around. Yeah. He's still in AEW, which is awesome. And uh, those are the three that jumped out at me. I watched WWF and WCW kind of kind of the same, mm-hmm. but th- those were really the three that jumped out at me. Also a big Barry Windham fan, liked Barry Windham a lot. So, uh, those were, those are probably the four that jump out at me the quickest. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I was, uh, I was, uh, I was a bit of Dusty Rhodes fan myself. Oh, Dust, Dusty mm-hmm. and Dustin. Um, who also like, uh, growing up, uh, nation of domination Farouk, of course. Um, yep. Ahmed Johnson, when he was a thing before he, he disappeared. Mm-hmm. Um, just so many, just, uh, way, way back to Tonka. I don't know if anybody remembers Tatanka, but yeah, I remember Tatanka. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I love them. Those are my, those are my dudes. Uh, so let, let's move, let's move back to, uh, to your content. Um, what got you into Silent Hill as your game. So Silent Hill is funny to say, I, I've been playing games all my life, mm-hmm. all of my life, but it did take me a little bit to get into horror games. Not that, not that I didn't like them. It's just, I didn't really know how to get into them. I was not one of the original Resident Evil players. Like when Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3 came out, I didn't play those games. Not that I didn't want to, I just didn't. And then one day, I went to my cousin's house for Thanksgiving in 2001. I had just turned 17 years old. So I get there. I think it was one of the first times or maybe the first time I drove there by myself. As a, as, like, as a new driver and driving out of town, we drove there and I walked in and he had Resident Evil Code Veronica on the PS2. So he played that a little bit, but he had to take it back that day. But I was going to be there for like a week, I think, or, or I think it was a week or at least that weekend. Can't remember. Yeah, I think it was a week because it was like Thanksgiving break on in school. So yeah, I was going to be there from like Wednesday to Sunday. So I got there, I think Wednesday morning. And he had to take the game back, but we knew I was, we were going to be hanging out for a while. So we went to get some games and he became obsessed with devil may cry. Cause code Veronica had the devil may cry demo in the, mm-hmm. in the, in the case. So he wanted to get that, but he wanted to get some more. And, you know, I remember just by chance, I was like, you know, I've seen commercials for this, for this game called silent Hill two on TV. And that looks pretty interesting. And we went to a local place. It wasn't like Blockbuster Video. It was just a place that was local to the area. And they had Silent Hill 2. So we rented Devil May Cry and Silent Hill 2. I played Silent Hill 2. And I became immediately obsessed with it. And so I stuck with Silent Hill, became a big Silent Hill fan. And then streaming started. 
So I kind of looked around and I was like, who's streaming on Justin TV in the video game directory? So I watch any, I would watch anybody that streamed Silent Hill. And at the time, Downpour wasn't out. The, the most recent game, I think, was Shattered Memories. So I would watch anybody that played Silent Hill, but there wasn't, there wasn't really a lot of people, there weren't really a lot of people that did. So I said, well, I'm going to get a capture card. And I did in August, I think it was August 2011, July 2011, August 2011. My first ever stream on Justin TV. Unfortunately, they're not archived because there's just there was just no way to archive that stuff yeah. then. But I had a, a, uh, a blind first time playthrough of Silent Hill Origins. That was my very first stream. And I got a, I got a little lucky. I was able to siphon some YouTube people over to over to Justin TV. So on my first stream, I think I had a max of 26 viewers, which would be unheard of today. That's just how different things were back then. Yeah. So it started out there. It got a really good reaction. And as time went on, people have sort of connected me to Silent Hill because I love the series, loved playing the games. So as I built my channel, I decided to focus on Silent Hill. I speed ran Silent Hill 4, and then I would do story playthroughs of all the games, and Downpour came out. So every Friday, this or every, I think at first it was every Sunday, just whatever one of my two days off from work were, I would do a story playthrough and play an entire Silent Hill game in one stream and do story playthroughs and such. And I did that. Gosh, I think I did that once a week for about until about 2018 or 19, I think. It was a it was a while. And it just got to a it got to a point where you can only play the same eight games so many times. But I took my interest and my love of Silent Hill and my understanding of Silent Hill. I was the guy that used to sit on game facts and read plot analysis and talk to people on forums about the story and, and theories and symbolism. I was that guy. And I had a passion for taking that information and passing it on to other people and being like, oh yeah, you see this? Well, this is what this means. This is what that means. Everything in Silent Hill 2 had some sort of meaning and I thought that was really awesome. So I, would, I loved passing that knowledge off to other people. And streaming and Justin TV, later Twitch, was the perfect, perfect medium for that. Because I could do it live. I could do something and then wait for people to ask something. Or I could notice that nobody said anything and just say, oh, well, this is what happened here. It's just, that was the beginning. And that was the beginning of my content stuff. And my whole, my whole aim with that was that maybe more people could enjoy that series for what it was and maybe see things that were a little bit deeper on the surface and enjoy them even more because of that. Yeah, because I, I feel like, I feel like for a lot of creators, um, myself included, like we have our one thing. Um, you, you with, you with Silent Hill, uh, me with, Persona slash Shin Megami Tensei. That's my thing. That's always going to be my mm -hmm. thing. I, I, like I, when I'll speed run it, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another story. Uh, like we can yeah. talk about that after. But um, so so you started with two, and uh, I that's honestly that's the first that's the first Silent Hill I played was two. I remember. It was a summer. It was a summer when I was home from college. And it was a funny thing. It was a cloudy yet foggy day outside. And I did nothing but play Silent Hill 2, where pretty much Silent Hill is being foggy. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, like at around, I'd say the evening, when, when evening was going to break and it was going to turn to night, the power went out. I didn't know, mm. I didn't know where flashlight was or anything. And so, funny thing, it was still kind of 
it was kind of getting to night, but it wasn't night altogether. So after a full yeah. day of playing Silent Hill 2 and me not knowing where the flashlight was, I just stood on the front porch until the lights came on. Because I was I was too much of a bitch to just go back <laughs> in the house after playing Silent Hill for that long and just things just being too coincidental and it, it being cloudy like that. At, it, yeah, I like Silent Hill 2 definitely kind of put a fear in me. Like a little bit of fear in me. Uh yeah. But would you would you uh okay, out of the series, would you say two is your favorite? Two two is my favorite, but I will say this in terms of genuine fright, sort of giving a feeling like what you had, Silent Hill four yes. was not like not my favorite by far, but there was something just completely off about that game where, you know, Walter starts chasing you around the forest and stuff, and then you realize that he's trying to kill you. I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember we were playing it at night. I had a few friends over at my place, and a few of my friends would step out on the porch to smoke. And I don't know what it was. It was, it was dead night outside. And I was like, I am not, I am not going outside. I because we had just done that part in the forest where Walter starts chasing you around. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not going. I'm just not. I don't want to go out there. I just don't. So I sort of had the reverse of what you had, mm -hmm. where the power went out and you wanted to just stand on the porch. I was the opposite. I wanted to just. I wanted to stay in. I didn't want to go anywhere outside the porch, but I didn't want to go anywhere outside at all, the porch or anything. But in terms of complete crazy fear. Silent Hill 4 is the scariest one for me, but overall Silent Hill 2 is, is, is my favorite of the entire series. There was just something about 2 that it handled these, it handled really complicated topics uh -huh. in a, in a very, I'll say mature way and didn't make jokes about them or minimalize their impact it's, it's sort of like it it sort it made them look serious like they were serious issues mm -hmm. without hitting you over the head with what a lot of them were it's just i love the way the subtlety was used in that game for a lot of stories mm -hmm. and to get a little personal that game came out in 2001 about two years after my dad died. Hmm. So I was already kind of sensitive to a few topics. Not that I was afraid of the topics, but I was very honed into like loss and death and things of that nature. And Silent Hill 2 is about that. It's about your dead wife and how you cope with that and things that happen and so and so. Well, I never had a wife, obviously, but I had some family members that are no, were no longer with me already at that point. Mm -hmm. So it handled the topics in a, in, a, in a way that you just didn't see in video games in 2001. And I thought, that was, I thought that was especially impressive. So not only was just the game itself great to play, I loved the way it handled all that subject matter and those topics. It's just, it's just, that's, this, this is the best game for me that I've ever played for all those reasons. It's funny because I, I'm wondering where, like, how you feel about three? Because three, I, three is my favorite. I loved Heather uh, as a character, and um, just everything that happened in three, it didn't, it didn't scare me like like four did. Like you said, four was just, I, I gave my friends four, like here, play this. And they're like, they give it back <laughs> to me a day yeah. later. No, can't do it. And like three, three didn't have the fear that four did, but it was to me a fun game. And I think it's the best. Yeah. I, I love Silent Hill 3. I remember I got Silent Hill 3 the day it came out. Mm -hmm. On the, the day it became available here was August 6, 2003. I still remember it. And I went and got it. They did not advertise anything about what that game was about didn't know anything about it. And we went 
and got it. Me and my friend went and got it, started playing it. And we had, we had played Silent Hill one after Silent Hill two. I went out and got a copy of Silent Hill one at the, uh, the local EB in the mall. So I got that one. I still have all those games on the shelf behind me. So we started playing Silent Hill three. And for those of you that were not around at the time, they didn't market Silent Hill three as a sequel to one. It just, it just wasn't marketed that way. And Konami told all of the people, all of the games media and stuff that reviewed the game, don't tell people what this is about. Don't tell people this is a sequel and blah, blah, blah. So my greatest memory with three was playing it with my friend. He had to leave around 930 because he had a college class the next day. And he was on his way home. And I kept playing the game on my own. And you hear the old soundbite from Harry Mason in the, the Hilltop Center. And I called my friend back and I'm like, dude, this is a sequel. You got to get back over here. It was just really, really cool. And yeah, Sonal 3 is not like the scariest game in the series, but man, it takes you on a ride. And once you kind of figure out, once you kind of figure out what's going on, the ride never stops mm -hmm. until the end. And Sonal 3 is another fantastic, fantastic game. And they added a lot of good quality of life features like with the menus and the user interface and stuff over Sonal 2, it's a so it's a very very good game. Sonal 3, it's it's possibly it's not possibly it is it's it's my second favorite in the series. Mm -hmm. My my tier list goes of the original games okay. goes two three one four. That's how I would rank them. But I, I enjoy all of them just because four is the end of that doesn't mean I don't like it. I I, I enjoy all of them a lot. And Sonal 3 is my second favorite of the bunch. What's uh, the one Silent Hill game? Not necessarily you tell people to avoid, but just least favorite. Um, and it could be any main, you know, any of the sides. Book of Memories, the one on the Vita. Uh, don't, don't, just don't, don't ever touch that. <laughs> <laughs> just don't do it. It's it's not it's not fun. So here's the thing. We cl we we clown on downpour a lot. But downpour has some really redeeming qualities to stream. Downpour is a fun game to kind of goof around with. You can't have fun with book of memories. There's no fun. There's no fun <laughs> clowning around. There's no memes, there's no nothing. There's nothing on book of memories. There's nothing but a bad time and boredom. It's, it's it's boring bad. It's just not good. That's the one that you stay away from. So I don't even stream it anymore. I, I, well, I will from time to time, but it's been a long time. But I'm just sitting here after a few hours. I'm like, oh my God, when when is this going to end? Like, when do when can I clock out? It's, all, it's one of the few times where I look at the clock when I'm streaming and I'm just like, oh, geez, what is, what is going on here? Now, on my Twitch channel, I used to, before I started uploading all my VODs on YouTube, I used to put all my first-time playthroughs in collections. So if anybody is interested, my original Book of Memories playthrough from 2019 is in my Twitch collections on my channel. So if anybody wants to go check it out, it's there. And it was it was an experience. And I've played it a few times since then. And... Uh, it's it's just one of those games where you don't even you don't even understand how it got made. Like downpour, you can kind of understand how it got made. It, it, it's it, it's a game. It functions. It plays. It's got stuff to do. It doesn't crash. You're fine. Book of Memories is just like how how did this get made? That's just I just don't understand. And a really good developer made that. Way Forward Games, a really good developer made that game. It's just really baffling. That's the one thing. If you if you're gonna play it, just be prepared to have a bad time. That's the one. Book of memories. So, I mean, you usually do you usually do story playthroughs. Are 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 we looking forward to another story playthrough of Book of Memories, or have you done one recently? I did not even a story on Book of Memories, dude. Like it's it's just it's just it's just like a this weird little roguelike binding of Isaac thing. And 
it's just there's no story. I don't even I don't even understand Pyramid Head. There's legit there's a legitimate thing in that game where Pyramid Head. I think it's Pyramid Head. It's either Pyramid Head or Voltiel, but I think it's Pyramid Head. Oh, that's another thing. Pyramid Head is just this basic thing that you can just randomly kill once in a while in a level, and it's like that's what we're doing to Pyramid Head. Then you have Voltiel, and they've come up with this weird storyline that he hates garden gnomes. That's a legitimate thing in that game. I, I can't make that up. It's something where Voltiel doesn't like garden gnomes or gnomes. It's, it's, it's a fever dream of, of Silent Hill thing. I don't even know if it's a game, but it's a thing. There is no story. There's just no story. It's just 500 levels and you just go through them and you figure out what you what on earth you have done wrong with your life to bring you to that point where you're playing book of memories. That's the only story in that game. So the, but never say never. If it's got Silent Hill on it, there's a good chance you'll see it on my channel. And uh, I don't do story playthroughs as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. I still play them periodically. We just finished a story playthrough of origins. I still go through them once in a while. Mm -hmm. But like I said earlier, there's only there's only so many times you can play the same games before they start kind of eating at the inside of your brain a little bit. Yeah. So I kind of space them out a little bit more and kind of branch out on in other games and other franchises as well. But you know, never say never. There's always a chance Book of Memories could pop back up. It, it, even though there's no story to tell, it could still come back. What's the most obscure Silent Hill you played? Because, I, again, I've seen, seen the Pachinko back there. Uh, did, you do, did you do the, uh, the uh, Silent Hill um, light gun shooter? Uh, the arcade game? Yes. Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember. It was in 2021. I was going through everything and I found an emulated version because that's the only way you can play it. Like the Sony arcade machine is this humongous monstrosity of four big pieces and there's no way I'm getting that. So I found an emulation online. I don't know if things have changed in two and a half years. But you could only play it if you had an Intel CPU. If you had an AMD CPU, it would crash after like, I think, 10 or 15 minutes at a certain part. So me, being as dedicated as I was to making sure that my viewers got the advertised content that they were going to get, I went and dug up uh, my Intel laptop in my laptop with my Intel CPU and I hooked my HDMI cable to it and I play, I will never forget it. I had the laptop on top of my keyboard on the desk. Cause I had no room. I had the laptop on my keyboard covering my front monitor and I played the arcade game that way. So I did play it one time and I have also done I want to say about three or four playthroughs of the Game Boy Advance story novel or play play novel. Silent Hill play novel. I've also done that a few times. That never came out in America. The only way you can really get to it is to emulate it. So, and it only came out, it only came out in Japan, not just not in America. It only came out in Japan. So God bless the the folks that have done fan translations for that that made it made it where people like me could play it. But I've played the play novel a handful of times. So the two, I would say, I have not played. I see Unnatural mentioning like the mobile. There was like some mobile games that came out in the late 2000s. I never played those. Never got my hands on those. But the the two most obscure that I've done, and I think, you know, Book of Memories may also be considered obscure. So there's that. Uh, the arcade game and the play novel on the Game Boy Advance. I have. I have had the pleasure of going through all of them. Although the arcade game and play novel were pretty, pretty interesting to go through. Play novel is like a retelling of Silent Hill one. And it's like a choose your own adventure type deal. So there's no real gameplay. It's just a text thing, but it's pretty cool seeing like all the wild crap you can make everybody do in that game. So it was pretty entertaining. And the arcade game was pretty good for a rail shooter. I enjoyed that too. 
yeah, I've seen video of the the rail shooter, and yeah, it, it's it's very interesting, especially the um the uh, pyramid head chase scenes, like where you just like, he just keeps coming, and you just have to keep just shooting the hell out of him. Yeah, it was so I fun. liked it. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, now I, I wanna I wanna kind of move forward to um Silent Hill when you first began when you decided you wanted to speed run it. So that was a thing where in 2013, I was, I was still very observational. I, yeah. I observed trends and what's popular and what people like and streaming was growing mm -hmm. in 2013 and speed running was starting to become very, very popular. The, the GDQ shows were starting to get like crazy amounts of viewers and even the speedrunners themselves, the ones I remember specifically were Siglemic and Narcissa Wright. They were getting a lot of, a lot of attention for their speed runs. And I thought, you know, like anybody, like I can do that. I can, I can do this. So I kind of looked around and there weren't really there wasn't really a lot of Silent Hill speed running content and there weren't a lot of people doing them. Uh, so I thought, Hmm, I got a chance here to be kind of different to do something that'll kind of set me apart. So I started thinking, and you know, we were just talking about Silent Hill four being the game. That's not the best, but the, but in some ways, the wildest of them all, just with the, Stuff that can happen. And I thought, you know, Silent Hill 4 is a game that is just crazy with the stuff people don't like. Inventory limits, the escort missions, uh, the backtracking. And I thought, you know, that would be an interesting game to tear apart and be able to blow through really fast. So I started scouring around in 2013, 2014. And I think speed run, I, I honestly, my brain kind of gets cloudy here. I, I, I don't recall what the leaderboards were. I think we may still have used speedrun.com back then. It just, it just kind of escapes me. But I remember there was a person named Crimson AE who had, a a world record on Silent Hill 4. I think it was like I want to say it was like 50, like 51 minutes or something. It's been such a long time ago. But I watched that run. I studied it and I thought, man, I could I think I could do that. I could, I think I could pull this off. So I just started, I just started running Silent Hill 4. So it was a combination of seeing speed running starting to become really popular. Speed running these days. I'm not going to say it's unpopular, but I, everybody has kind of seen speed runs these days. They know what it's about. It's not really a new thing. In 2013, it was a new thing. Like nobody had, nobody had really, not nobody, but a lot of people had just never seen this kind of stuff before. These games getting absolutely pulverized by people. Right. So it was a combination of seeing speed running starting to become super popular. And Silent Hill 4 being a really, really appealing game to me to destroy because I found it to be the most difficult of the original four games to go through. So that combination of those two things is what made Silent Hill 4 really appealing to me to speedrun. And also thinking of the streaming perspective of it, there was nobody streaming Silent Hill 4 speedruns in 2014. So I thought, okay, I can... I can satisfy these personal desires and I can also hit this streaming thing too and give, give somebody something new to watch. So it was a combination of all that that led me to speed running Silent Hill 4. Hmm. Now, Silent Hill 4 is the only game you've done, at, correct? Yes, the only one. The only mm -hmm. one. And then... um. Of course, you've been brought on from GDQ to do to do hosting. Mm hmm. Eleven times. Eleven times. How did that come about? Um, 
I really enjoy raising money for charity. And I Who thought, what, what better way to, uh, what better way to participate and do something. So here's the thing. So my, my mom doesn't really understand a lot of what I'm, a lot of what I've been doing. Mm-hmm. But, so I can't really say like, oh, I'm playing video games fast. Like I can say that and it wouldn't really, not that mom would dislike it. She supports anything and everything that I do. But if I can look at it and say, oh, we're, we're raising a lot of money for this cancer charity or we're raising a lot of money for Doctors Without Borders, I'm going to announce donations. That was also something that was pretty important to me to be able to do, to sort of find a way to bridge what I do to somebody who's not like the most tech, technology absorbed person like my mom. So that was pretty important to me too. I liked being able to say that I helped I helped raise some some money. And I also just wanted to see if I could do it. I wanted to see like if I could do something like that. It was the first way for, for me that really tested my chops as as a host. Mm-hmm. Like doing your own stream is one thing, but when you're on that kind of production and you're alive and you only get one shot at it, like that's that's a whole nother yeah. thing of pressure. And I really, really enjoyed the challenge. So it was a combination of wanting to see if I could do it and also just wanted something kind of wholesome to participate in and be able to tell my mom about. So uh, I auditioned. They brought me on. Every single time that I've auditioned, I've made it. I hosted two finales and I'm pretty proud of the of the portfolio that I've done. So. And it, but that was what initially led me to it. And it's quite a portfolio. Uh, again, like you've been on so much and you're, you're so easily recognizable. Uh, like I, I, I always watch uh, HGDQ, SGDQ, and you are mo- one of the most recognizable voices there. <laughs> like if I ever get, if I ever won, you know, you know, get the stones and the bravery to actually and the know-how to actually speed run something um, and do it well enough that I would be considered for GDQ. I would want you to be my host. Like, I don't know if that's a thing you can request. Like it, it, it'd be like, it'd be either you or Nicole. Because like my, my yeah, yeah. Nicole, Nicole, good night. Yeah, my good friend, Nicole, good night. Yep. Yep. I gotta get yep. her on here too. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you definitely can. Like you can't, obviously you can't demand, but you, they will ask you for suggestions. Like, Hey, do you have a preference? Uh, and they'll ask us too. Like, yeah. do you have a preference on games or is there any runs you might want to host? They can't guarantee that it'll, they can't guarantee that the stars will align, yeah. but they, they will, they will check in with you and see what you want to do. Yeah. Hmm. It's good to know. And oftentimes they align, not every time, but oftentimes. Being in the speedrunner community, the GDQ community, uh, has there been anything you've learned? Has, has there been any new experience that kind of like, you know, shoots out to you? Uh, I wouldn't really say new, but, and this isn't just, this isn't just speedrunning event centric. I, I got this at PAX as well. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't say new, but, one of the things that I always enjoy about these events and another reason why I guess you could say I, I get pulled to do event hosting is I get to meet a lot of great people yeah. when I do these things. I, 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 I love meeting people that I've known online and new people as well. Like there's always somebody new at the events. And while my, well, my, Nothing, not necessarily a new experience for me or nothing new that I've learned. I always develop at least one new connection from all these events right. and I'll, or I'll meet somebody and I have a policy where I try my best. I'm sure I've failed at this once or twice, but if anybody, like if I meet anybody, they take any pictures of me, you know, I'll follow them on socials and things like that because it's like, well, I've met this person and you know, they've seen me in person I've seen them in person. Like it's sort of just like, well, you know, we we've met in person. So I consider that to be some sort of a value thing. Mm -hmm. And everything is the way 
I would expect it to be, but I just get to make so many new connections with people at these events where that's really the pull for it for me. I can't say too many things have surprised me about my experiences with these events. So, so, and that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you want to look at it. But my thing is, it's not so much new things that I learn, but new, new connections that I get to make. And that's, that's what's really valuable to me with, with all of these events, not just GDQ or anything like that. Just, I get to make some new kind of connections and that's, that's really the best part of it for me. Well, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, uh, one thing I do um, outside of TwitchCon, which I've been to TwitchCon in years, uh, is Final Fantasy XIV Fan Fest. And every time I, mm. I get to meet so many people. Um, and it, it, like, still to this day, I'm kind of like, just the fact that people come up to me and I'm like, bro, I'm just a person who plays video games on. On, on, on online I, I play video games drink beer and drink whatever the hell i have yeah and that that's it that's all i do i'm nothing special like y- y'all are the ones special for even supporting my ass like it, it's just that it's just that level that like it, it always humbles me and it, like i love every time yeah i love you know just meeting the community meeting new people and and just coming together even hell even at twitchcon even, even though i haven't been in years and i'm maybe going this year uh but still like it, it's it's always one of the highlights uh of just going out yeah. and you know being a part of the community so yeah i definitely see where you you are coming from there um and even on the flights before TwitchCon, you get to run into some people right oh my right God, this <laughs> right <laughs> That was cool. That I still was one of my so favorite cool. things. Okay, so yeah, what he what he's referring to, like this was like for what what San Diego was it San Diego? I think it was. I, I can't remember. Or, was San Jose or San Diego? It might have been San Jose. I want to say I think it was San Jose. It was in San Jose. And and so I I get on my flight. I'm in my seat, and all of a sudden, this blonde haired dude. He's like, hey, Sly, how you doing? I'm like, oh, hey, we yeah, yeah we were on the same flight. We were on the same flight to TwitchCon. Yeah. That was awesome. It was. Oh my god, I still remember that. Holy hell! Me too. I remember it very well. It was awesome. So now, um, you, you being a part of you be you just being you. You being a, you being a, you know, content creator, you being a speedrunner, you being a host. Um, has there been anything through these years of what you've done? Uh, has there been, has, has there been any like learning moments for you? Like, has there been anything that you just, that just st- stuck out as a learning moment to you? Yes, plenty. Um. I have realized I don't want to, you know, I never want to be like too negative. I'm not really mm-hmm. a negative person, but I, I, I try to be real sometimes mm-hmm. when you are, and I've learned this the hard way a few times, you do have to be very careful who, who you give your time to. Okay. You do have to be very careful who you give your private time to. You have to kind of be a a good judge of who is genuinely wanting to like work with you and be a part of what you do versus somebody who may be trying to like sponge a little bit off of you. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very ignorant to that in the beginning of all this stuff. I just... I always had the mentality of, and I was just telling this to somebody about a week or two ago. I always had the mentality of, if you put your best foot forward, it'll figure itself out. But like, once you start getting to kind of a certain level, that is just simply not true. And I've had to learn the hard way that not not everybody contacts you or gets involved with you for the most noble of reasons and 
there's a lot of people, maybe not a lot of people, the, the fair majority of people that I have met through this whole thing have been tremendous folks. But no matter how good you try to be, no matter how um, you know, transparent, straightforward you try to be, there's always going to be, there's just always going to be some bad apples. So my learning experience was, you you always have to assume that not every not everything's perfect. You have to be a little reserved, like with your with your private time and who you work with professionally. Um, I won't say it's one of those things that has sort of like I, I'm trying not to spin this into like too much of a negative thing, but a yeah. learning moment is a learning moment, mm -hmm. and not all of those are positive. So I've learned to kind of be a little more careful and maybe a little bit more selective on who, like I, like I talk to, who's in my circle, you know, things like that. Uh, I've had a lot of learning moments and I'm not a dirty laundry kind of guy. So of course I won't really go into details, but you know, I've learned that over, over like 13 years of doing this, nothing's going to be perfect over that period of time. But I've definitely learned that you got to be a little careful um, with who you work with and who you allow into your private life or into your private, uh, so, or maybe not private, but like just personal stuff. You got to be a little careful with that and just that, that not just, not just peers, but also businesses. Yeah. I don't want to make it, I don't want it to sound like it's just peers. There's also businesses and brands and stuff that may not have your best interests in mind either. So it's just a combination of all that. I've had a few learning experiences over over the over the years. Again, I'm not the I'm not the guy that goes on social media and puts my dirty laundry out there. I'm just that's not my style. It never has been. If I get backed into a corner, maybe I will, but I don't do that normally. But it's something that when people come to me and they ask for some advice as well, I'm always quick to give my experiences on that. Just, you know, there's, there's always a little value in being a little careful. And those have definitely been my learning experiences uh, in this, I guess, in this whole career that I've had. It's just to kind of be careful uh, of, uh, of who you interact with and who you work with, both peer-wise and brand-wise, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of different a lot of different factors out there that may not have your best interests. And the only way that you can figure, you can figure that out is with experience. You're never going to, if you use a baseball terminology, you're never going to bat a thousand on those things. There so you, you just kind of have to, you kind of have to learn as you go. And I sure have. So that's, those have been my main learning experiences with this for sure. Now, again, I, uh, I remember, um, you know, watching you, uh, you know, before and after your first GDQ and then watching you, watching your su success just skyrocket. And with that, um, what have been, with the success, what have been some of the positives and maybe some negatives that you've seen with your success? The positives is I get to make a, I get to make a lot of people laugh. And I get to entertain a lot of people. Ever since I was a kid, I just like making people laugh. And one of the interesting little things, the duality of man, I guess they say, is when I was a child, I went through a went through a lot of loss and a lot of a lot of tragedy. And I found an escape from all that with comedy and making people laugh. And and not so much me wanting to laugh, but I got some sort of value of saying something stupid or funny and, and somebody laughing at it. And that kind of gave me the, the brain chemical on lock that made me feel good. And I was like, mm, kind of, I kind of like this. I like the, I like the joke telling thing. I like making people feel good. So one of the best things about what I've been able to do, I get to hear a lot. I get to hear a lot of stories from people who tell me very, very cool things about the impact that me streaming has on them. And I am not somebody that is afraid of heavy topics because my whole childhood was a heavy topic at times. So I don't run away from people that say kind of 
maybe extreme things. For instance, I got an email from somebody. I still have it. It's pinned in my email box. I still read it from time to time. Back in 2019, I got an email from somebody who wrote me a very, very thoughtful email. They stayed anonymous and I never asked them who they were, but they said, you know, I had a time where I was going through some really, a really dark time, had some really dark thoughts. And they said, I had a night where I was, I was very close to doing something very stupid and the stream that you were doing that night was so funny. And so whatever, that there was no way I could have ever done anything drastic during that because it was just, I was too busy laughing. And man, when I, when, when I read stuff like that, that's how I know, that's how I know that I've picked the right thing to do. Like, that's something I can't tell my mom, like, yo, I played a video game and people responded to this part of the game. My mom won't get that. But if I print that email out and I let my mom read it, she gets it then she gets what I'm doing. That right there is the most, um, the most beneficial and the most rewarding thing of streaming that I could even begin to explain. Like nothing else even comes close. I love being able to, I always say it on my streams and I, I don't want it to ever sound like a cookie cutter scripted thing because it's the way I feel every day. If you have a good day, let's make it better. If you have a bad day, let's forget about it for a little bit. Because I remember the days where I didn't have stuff like Twitch or Justin TV or streaming or anything to distract myself with online. When I was when I was a kid growing up, the internet was very limited. You remember that. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, too. Like We had IRC chat rooms, but we didn't have on-demand video and people to hang out with you know, or people that we could feel like we could hang out with. And I never, ever, ever try to mislead anybody or, or, or play into the parasocial thing. I'm very careful with that, actually, where I'm like, hey, you know, just remember, I'm just a guy on the internet. But when we keep those boundaries between us and people can still get that kind of value out of what, out of what we do, that's the best. Nothing else even comes close. In terms of, of negative things, um, you know, uh, I won't go into that again, but it sort of played into my learning experiences. You know, I've met a lot of people who I thought who not a lot. I've met a few people and a few brands who I thought maybe had my best interest and they didn't. And that was the, the disappointment that I feel when I find out that they didn't have my best interests or they just didn't. They weren't interacting with me for me they were interacting with me for a reason i went through periods where that hurt my feelings mm -hmm. and that was something that leads into the learning experience thing i had to learn how to kind of protect myself from having my feelings hurt a little bit after that so one of the negatives i will say is you do get exposed to more people a bigger pool of people a bigger pool of online people and we've even seen this and I feel like COVID, the COVID lockdowns ha sort of had an effect on all of us mentally, some of us more than others. We've sometimes you just have a, you just have moments where you deal with things and you see things happening and th they do kind of hurt your feelings a little bit. So I have been opened up. The more the more people that you're exposed to, the m just it's just math. The more likely you are to a negative experience here and there. Would I have had those experiences without streaming? No. But would have I would have I would I have had the good experiences that I've had with streaming without streaming? No. So you have to take the good with the bad. Like there's always going to be good and bad in our lives. So the good things, you know, I can do some really noble things and make people laugh and make people feel good. And and I've heard people even saying, like, whenever I do the wheel and the gift subs, somebody will come in and be like, oh, my God, I've never won anything in my life. And I'll be like, well, you just did today. And people remember that stuff. And I love being able to do that. It overrides all the, all the negativity that can arise from this. And negativity, if you let it eat you up, it will. It, it can and it will eat you up. And on a lesser scale, <laughs> and this is something that I've tried to reverse as well. Like when gaming is your job, sometimes you don't want to play games when you're not doing your job. Job, I say loosely, because this doesn't feel like a job. 
but you know what I mean. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It can be very hard to sit like here or on my couch and play a game and be like, oh God, I should be streaming this. Why am I not streaming this? Why am I not recording it? Why am I not doing this? And man, that can eat you alive too. So I've been trying to been trying to actively play games again without those thoughts, but it's so easy to get into that too. So that could also be kind of a a negative thing that maybe has come up from streaming. But overall, even though there's always going to be negatives in our life, the positives definitely for streaming have outweighed any negativity that I have uh, experienced. And those are just, it's just the way it is, but it, it's so, it's so rewarding to be able to make somebody's day a little bit better just by being a goofball on the internet. It's a, it's a dream come true. And that's, that's the main positive that I get from streaming. Absolutely. Um, and again, you, Definitely get like I definitely get what you just said in terms of you know outside of this being at this desk wanting to play games and it, it's just it, there's there like I'm not saying it's a time sink but it's you're you're dedicated to this for a certain many hours a day and then after this certain many hours a day that you do this. For a living, you are either exhausted or you just want to, you just want to eat. You just want to, you know, watch like a buzzer or GSN or what, or or a sports center or just not do anything related to game. And yeah, it's the, or just exist, yeah. just exist. Like that's also a thing. It's the worst feeling because, like, when we grew up, like this. I told my mom, I told my mom this like so many times and she's like, oh, okay. I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm going to grow up and play video games. With you. Like, okay. <laughs> and now she tells everybody like, he told me it was going to happen and it did. So mm-hmm. it, it's that, but like when you were younger, you, we didn't think of this as a job. This was like something we did after school or during sleepovers. It was just fun. It wasn't a job. We didn't think of sponsorships. We didn't think of viewership numbers. We didn't think of like anything like like metrics, anything. We just played games because we enjoyed mm-hmm. them. And we weren't trying to calculate how many people we could get inside of our house to watch us <laughs> play a game, like yes. so to speak. Yes. We weren't thinking about that. We just wanted to play games and that was it. That's all we wanted to do. Now like outside of it, it's just like, fuck, I'm tired. I really, I really yeah. want to, I really want to, and I really should dedicate more time. And, and, and like, my day off is my day off. Like, and I do dedicate some time to it, but more of the time that I dedicate on my day off is more towards back end stuff, which because you always got to, you always have back end stuff to your stream. Um, and yep. administrative stuff. Yep. And you're always working on that, like even outside of, you know, your normal stream hours. But even then, like my, my days off are taken up by that. And, and it leaves me a little bit of time to, you know, maybe do a little bit of gaming and whatnot. And I would like, how do you, how do you find, how do you find the balance? So, I stream, I think, and there's always a, a fluid answer to this. It's okay. it's always different from time to time, but I stream, if I'm on my normal schedule, I'll stream maybe four days a week. I, just because of the energy that I put out and the strain that I put on these vocal cords, yeah. I don't often do three days of streaming in a row. It's just not, I could do it, but it probably wouldn't be good for my throat and my energy and stuff. So I'll usually do two days. So I'll lately what I've been doing, I have sort of gotten myself into more of a normal people schedule where I'm not like staying up all night anymore. And I'm kind of waking up a little bit earlier. So I've kind of used that into sort of how I balance things as well. 
getting sunlight, even though I'm a vampire and my skin burns really easily is still important at times. But so I've always been very, very careful of not overdoing it. And I think some people, they have, they see the 24 hour streams. They'll see people that just stream constantly, constantly, constantly. And it does work to a, to a degree. I have always been very careful and it starts here. That's always where it starts. It starts in your brain. You just have to be conscious of what you're doing and make sure that you don't overdo it. What I do is on my, I, I have never had a schedule ever, never had a schedule because I thought the moment that I ever make a schedule, it's going to feel like work. There's going to be a day that if I don't want to stream, I'm going to have to stream because I said I was going to stream. And then if I don't stream, then I look unreliable and blah, 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 blah. So I've never had a schedule. Uh, that's always been a me thing. That doesn't work for everybody else. Works for me. So that's how I handle it. First and foremost, I'll wake up, I'll get a drink and I'll sit around for an hour or two, see how I feel. If I feel like I can be funny that day and fun and not irritable, I'll stream. And if I do feel like I have a day where, you know, something may bug me irrationally or something may bother me irrationally, I'll take the day and make sure that I'm at least doing something related to the stream, but not overdoing it. I've overdone it sometimes where I spend every day, every, every moment of a day doing something, working on the bot, editing a video aside from a few, a few emotes uh, in my channel. I mostly create everything that you see on my channel. Like, I do, I do my own video editing, like anything you see from me on TikTok or Instagram reels, I make it. And how I keep the balance is just making sure that I never overdo it to the point where I wake up and I say, gosh, streaming, Ugh, I don't want to do this. And that is not a one size fits all answer for everybody. And your mileage may vary, but I've always made sure to not do too many days in a row to make sure that I give myself the time to enjoy the things that I enjoy, like, like baseball, even though the Braves are losing right now, baseball is a thing that I enjoy. We talked a lot about wrestling earlier. I, I, I'm admittedly not as much into the current day stuff as I have been. But, you know, like this weekend, I'll, I'll we'll probably watch a little of WrestleMania because it's a yearly tradition. I just make sure to give myself the time that I need. And, you know, I'm in, an, I'm in a relationship as well with Reliever. And it, it, at times, it's a long distance thing. She just left the country yesterday. So I, I make sure that I have the time that I can dedicate to, to hanging out with her. It was easy for the last month and a half because she was here, but now, you know, she's back with her family elsewhere. So I make sure I have enough time where I can, where I can devote to that too. It's just making sure that I have the time to do the things that make me happy and not letting my brain trick myself into feeling selfish about it. And that's easier said than done on some days, but I'm getting better about it these days. And it's just all about making sure you have your leisure time. Even if it's nothing, even if you just want to sit on the couch and exist, that can be valuable too, because if you, if you enjoyed it and you got something out of it, you didn't really waste your time. So the the balance for me is just making sure that I still partake a little bit in my leisure activities like baseball or just watching YouTube or or whatever's going on in wrestling right now. If something big happens, like the stuff with The Rock and Cody Rhodes, I'll check that out if yeah. it gets my attention. Just just making sure that I devote enough time to things that aren't related to streaming and things that I enjoy. That's that's what I do to maintain the balance. That sounds really, really, really healthy. And I, 
I should be taking notes and I, I have this for video proof. I have this for video proof because like I'm like I have been I, I've been known to be horrible about it. And I feel like last year, because I tried to do so much and there's only one me and there's only so many hours a day where I'm awake. Last year got away from me. And there are like and I told myself this year, you know, I would, you know, one, take a vacation, which I did. Did so much for me, did wonders for my mental. Two, you know, I would keep my day off. Uh, like even if I'm sick, which I was sick earlier this week, uh, still had my day off. Screw you, no. Still gonna take mm-hmm. the day off. Suck it. <laughs> um and like I still like say I'm like I'm saying I'm gonna do, you know, me content and you know, kind of not force things. Cause I, I feel like that's another thing that at we as content creators do a lot in in terms of you know going after trends and whatnot. We we kind of force things. Um maybe maybe not just the content, maybe just trying to force ourselves, maybe just forcing ourselves to, you know, go beyond what we normally do. And, you know, like, I feel like, I feel it more now because like, I'm still growing in 10 years. I'm still, I'm still fucking growing. And it's like, oh my, yeah, it's like, I, I kind of have to force myself to, to, you know, day, day, day in, day out, you know, I feel like I'm kind of forcing myself to do this sometimes. And that can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. It, it could it, like, like it's 50, 50 for me. And I, I want to get to a point where I just stop forcing it and just let it be. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this to kind of jump off of that. I'll tell you when I really started feeling that allure and that pull to kind of put every amount of, time you can into it was when COVID started. Mm. I remember when, yeah, when, uh, when March, the, when it became clear that something was going on and, and it wasn't going to end, you know, in, what was it? 14 days to stop the spread or whatever. Yeah. When it became clear that 14 days wasn't going to do it and that this was going to be a thing. I remember in April, 2020, I said, okay, uh, this is, this is the time I gotta, we've got to bear down here and really start doing this thing. Cause there's suddenly a lot of people at home that don't have anything to do and they need something to watch. And I, I can provide that. Right. So in April, 2020, I, I was started to hit the ground running real <sighs> hard that month. And I didn't, you know, and everything ended. There were no conventions. A lot of conventions are usually my vacation at the same time, even though I'm doing stuff at them. They're still like my leisure time. And those went away. So it just became like stream, 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 stream. These people need something to watch. They're here. If you build it, they will come and they they are here. You build it, they they will arrive. They're here. And I remember in 2020. I go back and look at my Twitch tracker chart for April, May, and June 2020, and I'm just like, whoa, how did I do all that? Yeah. It was just it was just constant streams. And that for me, and I know I'm not the only one. Uh-huh. That was a that was a time for all of us where it was really easy to dive in and forget about that balance because there was there was nothing else to do. And for me, I don't know about you, but for me, it did take me a while to reverse a lot of my uh, habits that I developed during that in terms of like, okay, there's nothing going on in the outside world. What else am I going to do? I'm going to stream. I have the time. This is my full-time thing. I got to stream. And now as the world has sort of normalized a little bit, it is a little bit easier to kind of rewind a little bit and and realize that it's okay to not put every second into streaming. But when you were saying what you were just saying earlier, that made me want to jump in and and say that for me, when COVID started, that was just that was where a lot of my put it put it in fifth gear and go to 150 miles per hour kicked in because there was just nothing else going on. Right. 
that's where a lot of a lot of habits that I developed had to be had I had to start reversing that after a while because I was putting so much time into everything that I wasn't giving myself any time. So right. because a lot of my a lot of balance restoration came about mm, a year, about two years after COVID, the COVID lockdown started. Because we thought it was a necessity. We, like, like we thought, you know, people need something. Like you said, people need something to watch. We are that something. And I kind of feel, still feel like I'm in that mode. Not just n- merely out of necessity because, because again, I'm still growing. And it's just like, mm-hmm. with, with that growth, like me, like, I kind of treat myself as a small business. Like we're grassroots. We, we are our own cheerleaders. We are our own bosses and we, we got to do the hard stuff to kind of, you know, make the donuts and whether that's, you know, doing a 12 hour stream sometimes, or, you know, going seven, <laughs> seven days a week, which God, I'm so glad I got away from, even though like I did it for the longest time, I got away from it. Thank God. Um, yeah. Now I'm glad you did too. Yeah. One of, one of my very dear friends, Maxi Lobes. I remember back in the oh, day, Maxie. he used to stream every, literally every day. And I'm like, Oh my God, how's this guy doing that? So yeah, it's it's a real thing. I've done one 24 hour stream. I did it as a as an incentive during the first September. I said, if we get to 10k sub points, I'll do it. And the freaks that watch me did it immediately. I felt like pirate software for like maybe five minutes of what he <laughs> experienced the other day. And I did 20, I did 24 hours in January 2022. It was actually I didn't know it at the time, but it was the last stream that I did in my old house, the place where I used to live. Uh-huh. And I saw, I saw my stuff afterwards. I never watch my metrics when I'm streaming, but I look at them afterwards. Like I'll look at viewers and stuff, but I'm, when I'm streaming, everything's hidden. I don't see a number anywhere, but I'll go back and I look at it afterwards and I'm like, Oh, I see why people do this. This is uh this was a thing. I never did it again, but it was, uh, 24 hour streams or a while but like when i was those, the, it, i'm whenever somebody can pull themselves away from the habit of doing super long streams all the time or like in your case like seven days a week or whatever i'm always like oh thank god they'll 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 love themselves a little bit more for doing that so it's all when i was see. younger i did so many 24 streams like when i was starting out like in, in doing you know getting into final fantasy 14 and stuff i did quite a few 24 hour streams as i grew like i i decided you know what i'm old now and you know Mm -hmm. i I can't do it like i used to so maybe make that a special thing maybe make that like a like hell i don't know when the last time i've actually done 24 hour like it would like it would be to the point where i sometimes i would inadvertently do 24 hours like i wasn't planning on it but yeah, like somehow I, like Sly, you've been up since yesterday. Like, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, like it wasn't even like a thing that I planned. It was just it just happened. Like now I don't do either planned or inadvertent. It just I I can't. Like it, it has to it has to be a special thing. So I don't know. I might yeah. make that a I might make that a a, a gold thing whenever. We reach some outlandish number. I'll do a twenty-four hour, but I had to prepare myself for it because I'm, I'm yeah. getting up there. As we get older, the it's it's I, I've discovered that, or at least what I felt with that is like not doing it was the problem. Uh-huh. It's the recovery that's the Ooh. problem. It took me like it took me three or four days to get normalized. Yeah. And I see Roxy Luffer in the chat. I'm I'm with Roxy. I don't even think I can stay up. Even on my own, just existing, doing nothing, I don't think I can. I don't think I can even stay up for twenty four hours, like on my own leisure time anymore. So I feel like, but the recovery is the killer. Yeah, and of I, all that, and I feel like the only reason that I do stay up sometimes is to correct a bad sleep schedule. That is the only going to mm-hmm. be the only reason why, like, 
I am just like up for an ungodly hour. It's just like if I've done something and where I've, I've, you know, been up for too long working on something, I will correct yeah. it just by staying up and just trying to like force myself to sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I've always, I've always heard whether this is true or not. Uh-huh. I've always heard that like, if you want to correct a sleep schedule, what you do is you wake up and you eat at the time that you want to wake up. And then you don't eat anything. You go on a fast until that same time the next day uh-huh. and like food, the way your body responds to like food schedules sometimes can help with that. Hmm. But yeah, like I, I've heard of that, but I know a lot of people that do the, the, the reset thing and they stay up and they do the reset thing. But how often, like I, I've never done that. How does that stick or does it, does it, is it easy to lose that schedule again? Like how does that, how does that go? It's easy to lose it when you in, when it when you intentionally like go outside of it. When you like stay up and you have stuff to work on, you're like working through like I work throughout the night sometimes and by the time I'm done, I'm like, yay, I'm done. And I look outside and the sun's coming up. And <laughs> yeah. it's like, well, I screwed myself. Um yeah. Yeah. It, like it, it, it sticks for a while until you break the habit again. That I will say that. Yeah. That's the only time it won't. I know that feeling. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, I know, I know that feeling. Like when we were at PAX, uh-huh. when we were at PAX, we were, we were kind of on a normal schedule. We're waking up in the morning, going to bed like around maybe around 12 or one. The first day I come back to stream, I end up doing like a 10 hour stream and I'm up to like five and I'm just like, Oh my God, this is the latest I've been up in a week. So just it's, it's that easy yeah. to kind of let it slip. Yeah. Now, one thing I, I want to go back to one thing you said, because like I um, got this question asked uh, before I took my vacation. You, you talked about like when you go to like Twitch cons and hacks and everything in, in you, you say, that's kind of like a vacation for you. I disagree a bit because I feel like when you go to TwitchCon and when you go to PAX, you are on as you are on as an eternal enigma. You are on as a, as a creator. You, yeah. you, you, you may be like, you may have fun while you're there, but you're still on. When's the last time you have taken a vacation and you were not on as an eternal enigma? Cause I got that question so- asked to me. So the thing is, like, it's so hard to disconnect me from everything completely. Mm -hmm. I have gone to visit Reliever in Australia twice now. Oh, wow. But even when I'm out there, I'm like, uh, I I need to stream. I need to set up my stuff and stream. So, man, that's a, that's a tough question. I got to say, because I'm always, I feel like I'm always doing something somewhere and I don't feel like it's because. I have to, I just still like doing it, but I'm trying, I'm trying to really rack my brain here. Cause that really is a good question. Uh, kudos to whoever suggested that the last time that I genuinely went and did something where I didn't feel like I had to be enigma. Maybe I would say there was a day, not this last time. But I think it was a few, it was last summer when Reliever was here. We had a day right before she left. We went to, we went to like downtown Atlanta and we did a whole bunch of stuff. We went to the, we went to the Georgia Aquarium. Um, I remember another point. I don't think this was the same, the exact same day, but we also went to the, to the world of uh, Coca-Cola in Atlanta and we have also hung out with some friends. Uh, some of you who follow my channel may know uh, Jazzy Wazzy TV and Gaddy. They Gaddy uh, participates in a firing range up in Atlanta. We we just hung out and did that too. But there was a day that we just we went to the aquarium. We went to go eat. We went to go watch the Braves at Truist Park that day. 
It's like an all day thing. And while it wasn't like a vacation per se, it was a day where I was doing stuff all day, but not one time did I think about pulling this thing out and checking it or filming something or looking at anything. It was just a day to enjoy everything and kind of just kind of be me for a little bit. And there was nobody around. Not that there's any problem at all when people are around that know me. Because I love that stuff. I love talking to people. But there was no one around that knew who I was. I just got to kind of chill and walk around and be unsuspect for a little bit. And I just remember that day in particular. Because we were out all day in a, in a place that wasn't home. We were out doing all these things. Um, and we've had a day or two like that in Sydney, Australia, when I went out there and, and we weren't recording anything, didn't film anything. So I don't have many, I would say vacations per se. Every time I go out of town on an extended thing, it's usually gaming related or something related to me being an eternal enigma. But I'll, I'll find a day here and there with Reliever where we will just go somewhere for a day, do a lot of things, and I never once feel like i got to pull out the camera and film it or upload it or do anything related to Twitch. And those days are pretty valuable. I, I don't need a whole lot of those, but you do need them from time to time. and. I would say just those days where I can go out in a day. I get a little antsy when I'm too when I'm when I'm away from it for too long. I just I just am. I, I can't stay away from quote unquote work for too long. Right. But I would because I do get a little antsy. It's just I, I do enjoy what I do. And when I'm away from it for a while, I do get a little antsy. But that day, I would say. The day, the last day that we had in Sydney where we just went like everywhere and ate way too much food that last day that I was there. And then that time she was here last summer where we went to the aquarium, went, went out to eat and went to the Braves game afterwards. I would say those two days are the last two days that stick out in my mind where I could just be me and not worry about content creator and eternal enigma those are the two days and i have very good memories of them for me when i got asked that question my answer like was 10 years ago oh yeah yeah that that's the last time i've and that was when i started that was when i started streaming and like I wasn't like you know I didn't have the notoriety or anything I was just you know doing it as a hobby. So that was the last time I had taken a vacation to where you know like nobody knew me. I wasn't doing like I wasn't doing anything for Sly, aka Gray Fox. I was just you know having fun. And mm -hmm. like this year I finally did it, and it it felt so good. I got the best sleep I have. I've gotten in like years yeah, and just like, just had the best time, honestly. And it like, I, I probably need to do that every year. Honestly. Yeah. I would say the same for me. Yeah. I'm starting to value my time sort of not value my time away, but not beat myself up too much. If I'm away, yeah. I remember my partner anniversary came up in February and I was planning to take a week off but I got a little overwhelmed with some things like in my personal life and I was having a lot of meetings with brands and stuff and I was working on tons of stuff. I got a little, went a little too far, got a little, got a little overworked and I ended up taking two weeks off and I was like, oh boy, I just spent like a week sitting around doing nothing and it turned out that it was fine. Right. It was totally fine. Nothing changed. So I'm starting to learn the value of, of that too. And I, I am the same way as you. I probably need to, do that a little bit more. The last time I had a like a leisure trip, not just a day, was maybe I went to I went to Destin, Florida for a few days in 2017, mm -hmm. and that was probably the last time I had a real like vacation. So, 
I definitely need a little bit more as well. And Nick, thank you again so much for coming on and uh, again, sharing your story, uh, your experiences with the community. Um, I always ask, like to ask one final thing um, because, you know, you, you've taught, I feel like you, you've taught so much. You are a coach. You, you are a coach for your community <laughs> and, and, and coach in many other ways. So before we jet, uh, if you could, as like through your experience as a content creator, speed runner, host, everything for someone, well, well, let's just start for someone getting into content creation. Uh, if there would be a, a piece of advice that like you somehow didn't get, but like learn through your experiences, uh, that you could give to them. Cause I, I kind of feel like I maybe need to hear it too. What would it be? So when I started, there was no advice to get. There was nobody who did this. There was nobody who had a clue what they were doing. We were all just winging it. There was nobody to hear any advice from or anything. And thankfully, over the last 13 years, I have accrued a lot of information. When you get into this thing and entertainment in general, I used to do a lot of observation of the uh, of the comedy industry as, as well, like stand-up comedy and stuff. Anything with entertainment. If you are going to get into it, you have to make sure that you love it first and foremost. You have to make sure that you love what you're doing because if you go in entertainment, you're already you're already against the odds. You can put as much time as you want into something. And in this line of work, it's not like anything else. You could put X amount of hours into something and you're guaranteed nothing for it. You're just not. And you have to be prepared sometimes to get nothing for something. One piece of advice. It's a quote I've I heard a long time ago. It, it It's, I'm trying to get it right. They said, if you think you can, you might be able to. But if you think you can't, you damn sure won't. So if you get into this, you got to believe that you can do something because if you don't think you can, then you probably won't. You have to love what you do. You have to believe that you've got something to contribute to the world. You got to believe that you're capable of it. One piece of another piece of advice that I heard about a year ago that God, I wish somebody had told me ages ago. I I, I don't want to misattribute the quote, but I, oh man, I want to say it was like Frank Sinatra or something where they said, it, where they said, show, show biz is easy, kid, as long as you're focusing on entertaining the audience instead of yourself. I feel like that is also a very, very crucial thing that especially earlier Enigma probably could have advice earlier Enigma could have used to kind of stay focused on what was going on. As long as you're focused on entertaining the audience more than yourself, focus on the audience. You got to love what you do. You've got to expect nothing. You've got to understand that you're already against the odds, but if anybody had told me that I was against the odds 13 years ago, I might not have ever tried it. So I always say that with an asterisk that says, you never know until you do it what may happen. Because 13 years ago, both me and my mom, and my mom obviously doesn't do content creation. She has her own things going on, but we were both in pretty pretty bad places in our lives financially and, and just everything going on. And if, if it was, it was, it was pretty easy to be negative about everything. So, you know, I always qualify what I'm saying because if Enigma from 13 years ago would have heard like, Oh, you know, just 
you know, don't expect anything and blah, blah, blah. You're going to see, I was like, well, gosh, I can't do that. But at the same time, a guy like me 13 years ago, who was like going nowhere on a runaway train, going nowhere fast, so to speak, to be able to turn this into what I turned it into, I would have never experienced it had I just not gone for it. So there is always something to say about throwing caution to the wind and just going for it because you never know what may happen. My pieces of advice, if I can just bullet point them, you got to love what you do. If something is making you not love it, cut it out or stop it immediately. Never expect a thing. Work hard. Be as kind as you can to people. Understand you're never going to be perfect and no one else is. And just do the best you can. Give yourself the best shot. And you just never know what may happen. But you got to give yourself the best opportunity every day to succeed. And you got to believe that you can. And even if you didn't succeed that day, that does not mean that you will not succeed tomorrow. And as long as you love what you do, you've always got a shot. That would be my advice. Ladies and gentlemen, Eternal Enigma. Thank you.